name is Kenneth. Uh, I'm actually a Dane, so I live actually pretty close by. I work for Intel in the Open Source Technology Center, where I work and in our web team, trying to like find a strategy to what we should do on the web and how to enable like new use cases, enable app-like experiences and the like. This means that I work on Chrome uh, and I work in the W3C on different specs, uh, etc. As he just mentioned, I'm also a Google developer expert uh, in the field of web technologies. So we're here today to talk about smart devices. So what makes a device smart? Like, is it really smart that if I want to turn off the light, I need to pick up my phone, unlock it, where is that app again? Oh, there it is, loading, loading. No, maybe that's not so smart because we already have like a small switch. We can just like, click and light turns off. So we really need to think about these cases, like are we solving real issues? Um, are we there when you need it? Like is the device around? Uh, it's not like where's my remote control? I can't find it. And things need to be easy to use. They need to be low friction. We don't want this like, ah, I don't want to install your app. Like I just want to do things. Do we really need to wait for 100 megabytes to download? No, I want it now, right now. Like, and when we get all these different devices around us, people are talking about like the ambient computing, everything is connected, everything is online. Well, maybe apps don't scale well enough for that. Because like, you have probably all seen like a Windows desktop like this. You know, on phones, it's becoming the exact same. We have all these different icons. This lack of overview. And then you have these updates for these apps that you had to install maybe half a year ago, but you never used ever since. If you look at the different usages, um, you can split them up, or I split them up into three groups. There are some apps or some experiences that you need like every day, like for devices like turn on my lights, turn off my lights. Some that you need once in a while, like oh, it's really warm outside, I really want a cold beer, so I'll change the temperature of my fridge. And are these apps that you use like once or twice in your life, like I'm in San Francisco, I need to park for my car. But when am I back? Maybe a year from now, maybe two years from now, who knows? Maybe never. So maybe there's a better model. We want low friction, we want ease of use. That's where we have the web. Everyone gets this. Put in a URL and there you are. But people say, well, the web is not good enough, it's slow, but I'm happy to announce, at least on the Chrome team, we spend a lot of time trying to fix that. So this is with a focus on speed. This is a focus on like HTTP2 to server push, service worker, something called a purple pattern, et cetera, et cetera. We want the web to be fast. So for instance, with a service worker, you can cache things so it actually works offline, but you can also just cache things so it becomes faster. So the next time you launch your app, it's already there. At least all those resources, critical resources you have. This unfortunately means that we will not see the dinosaur any longer, and I'm really sad about that. It's so, it's so, so cute. But basically, the takeaway is that web is really ready. You can do these things today. Apps can work offline, or sites. They can be fast, and they can be responsive. Take a look at this example. Wow. That's pretty nice, that's pretty fast. But that, that, that can't be the web, right? That, that's a native app, right? I, I didn't see any address bar. It launched fast, there was an icon on my home screen. Yes, this is what we call progressive web apps. This is what we've been working on enabling in Chrome. And they're great for one-time usages, the low friction of the web. Enter URL. If you want something more, if you want to engage with the app, you can add it to your home screen. So it's always handy when you need it. It's also no clutter, no URL bar if you don't need it, if you have it on your home screen. And it has the property of the web, it's safe, because the web is designed to be safe out of the box. But you might wonder, but all these kind of different devices like Bluetooth and whatnot, they kind of live outside of, of the sandbox. I'm happy to announce that the, this works with the web as well. But one thing I want to keep in mind, because I'm going to talk about two different technologies today, uh, something called Web Bluetooth and something called Web USB, is that companies, they don't really care about like, oh, it has to be use, uh, USB, it has to be Bluetooth. They just want things to work. 
So these technologies can actually work well together and they're diff for different use cases. But first, you might actually want to listen to this talk because we all heard about Lars, who was downstairs. Um, he's actually been cooking up a quiz so you guys can actually win stuff. So uh, there are some small de devices uh, from Nordic. They're super cool and maybe you will get some hints if you l listen to this talk or you go down and talk to Lars uh, afterward. I'll give you the URL at the end of this talk. So let's look at Bluetooth. Bluetooth is, well, everyone knows Bluetooth. It's cabled. It's widely used. Um, it's not cable, oh, sorry. It's, <laughs> it's talking about Bluetooth, not USB. <laughs> it's widely used, it's kind of like everywhere. We all have seen like a Bluetooth mice, Bluetooth keyboard, headset. Um, it doesn't use a lot of battery. And that's pretty handy because like you don't want to drain like your mouse to stop working after 10 minutes. And it's wireless. It's also rather cheap, easy to work with, and it has some built-in beacon functionality, a way that devices can tell that they exist and they are close to you. Some of the disadvantages uh, is about security. So while you're sending radio waves, people can actually listen to those radio waves. So if you don't want people to do that, maybe you need to encrypt it and make sure that no one finds a way to sniff them. It's also not powered, so well, there needs to be a battery in your device, device you're talking to, or it needs to be plugged in. So as it's, a, a wire, as it's with radio waves, uh, there can be problems with stability if there's a lot of different devices around, uh, and also with speed. This is how it works. So here's one example of a phone connected to one of these light bulbs. And just look at, the, uh, at, at what, what's possible. You just change the colors. That's pretty frictionless, frictionless, I think. So um, Google has been working on this spec called Web Bluetooth. Um, it's pretty stable. It's already shipping in Chrome. So you can actually go and use this today. It's based on what call, what's called Bluetooth 4 point something, like Bluetooth 4, Bluetooth 5, and even like the future. So this is like kind of a refort Bluetooth. It's not the same as the old Bluetooth. It's still called Bluetooth because it's done by the same group, but it's a really, diff uh, really different protocol. So it uses a protocol called Generic Attributes, or GAT. Um, the API is really easy to use and uses all the modern web technologies and API design, such as promises and typed arrays. So it doesn't work with the old-fashioned Bluetooth devices, so no classic support. And your device, like your phone, um, will be like the central. It can connect to peripherals. It cannot become a peripheral itself. So support is getting pretty good with Chrome. Uh, it works really great on my Android device. But in order to use all these new uh, technologies, we want the web to stay safe. We need to use HTTPS. This is a requirement. But you also don't want to be surfing around on the internet and suddenly you go to your favorite news site and suddenly it's connecting to one of your devices at home. That would be scarier. So it requires you to have like a user gesture, like you're clicking on a button or something similar in order to actually connect to a device. So it looks something like this. This is like a heart rate monitor. I click on it, it will pop up a dialog, I'll select my device, and whew, there you go. Really, really frictionless. So let's look a bit of like how you actually do these things. So here you see, uh, if I can get the light, you just request a device. There's some filters, so GAT protocol has some predefined filters. If you make your own devices, they might just use a UUID instead. Uh, then if it works, the, the user actually selects one of these devices, returns a promise, you get a device, you can do something with it, or you can handle errors as well. You can also, if devices have like specific names, you can also look for the name instead, like if I did my own little robot. If uh, some of these devices, they have different services. I'll get back into what services are. But if it has like service A and B and have another device which just has service A, uh, and I actually want to connect to service B if it's available, I need to list it as an optional service. So this is, the, this is how Bluetooth GAT protocol work. Um, you have something called a profile. Uh, which has services, which has characteristics. 
you're probably all like JavaScript developers. So the way you can think of this is that like a service is kind of like an object and the characteristics are like properties. There is one difference because this is like, it's a protocol. So a lot of people, a lot of devices, instead of just using like, this is a bool, this is a string, they'll actually use like an int, like an, uh, a bit array and actually stuff off like multiple values into the same array. So just keep that in mind. So how do you connect to the get service? Well, you request a device, you get a device, uh, then you connect to the get service and that returns like a server to you, which you can work with. So it works like, like this. You get the service, then you can subscribe to a characteristic, or you can get a characteristic. Here I just read the value, and that's it. Battery percentage is some value. You notice I use this get u int 8. This is because it's, it's a typed array. Just the same way I can write a thing, if, if depending on the protocol, but this one has like a heart rate control point. I get the characteristic back, and I just write a value. Very, very easy to use. This is a more like evolved uh, example. We actually try to subscribe to values because some values might change, like you just saw with the heart rate. So instead, you just need to add a, an event listener, and from the event listener, you just handle it. Really, really easy to use. But sometimes you, you want to, like we were talking about the web, it's about discoverability. Uh, and you might not know where is the app for this service. So I was talking about like Bluetooth having this bootstrapping built in. Um, and on top of this, uh, Google has been working on something they call Edistone, which allow you to actually find these devices around you. It does require you to enable Android nearby on Android for it to actually show up, uh, and something similar on iOS if you use Chrome. Actually, if, if you have that enabled on your phone today, you'll actually find the, the schedule for cold front uh, as a Bluetooth uh, beacon. So that's pretty cool. I used that yesterday. So this means that, uh, that devices around you, so sites can actually uh, can say that where they are and what site is associated with them. So it looks something like this. I might go to like a bus stop and, and I'll see there's some links behind. This is the old UI. And so hey, there's like two different links in this one. It's like the estimated time of arrival for this bus and some information about the company. So this is actually a real example from London would have deployed this. So you just click on it and you can see like, oh, yeah, this is my bus schedule. Uh, super cool. And you could also use this, for instance, for payments. So this is an example that Google did, uh, where you just go close to a device, it will show up the app and you can actually pay uh, for parking. So a lot of uh, options and possibilities there. And uh, I don't have time to go into more details about it, but here's one link where you can check out and learn more. So let's look at the USB instead. Now we've finally got to the wired part. So <laughs> USB, they're widely in use. Uh, I probably have something some around here. Yeah, there's a USB one here, right here. They're cheap, they're cabled, they're pretty secure because you don't have any wave radio waves, um, and they're fast and stable, and they can even power devices. So this is actually pretty cool. Like think about like if you really want to, if you have a machine inside a factory, uh, you might not want to use Bluetooth because like if someone finds out how to hack it and they're standing outside and controlling your machine, that might be a problem. But with a cable, you can just have it behind a hatch with a physical key. Um, and you can use it maybe inside of hospitals where there might be other equipment that might be affected by something like Bluetooth. You can say that the disadvantage is that it's cabled. It kind of depends on your use case. Sometimes this is good, sometimes it's not. USB has no radio interference, and like I said, it can be locked behind a hatch. Users, companies, they don't care which technology you choose. Just choose the one that fits your use case. They exist really well together. So here's one example I did. Uh, I did like this IoT device, uh, and you see it's currently unplugged. I plug it in, and a short time after, it will actually pop up on my screen. Also some kind of bootstrapping. So yeah, it's on, you see a dialog. Now if I click on this, it will actually load that web page. And this is like a small like JavaScript editor because the device I had actually runs JavaScript. So I made like a small IDE. 
you see it has the web USB, uh, and you can see there's actually some JavaScript code. I can press run, and it should actually run on the device itself. Uh, I think I'm pressing run now. There is uh, run, and now you should see the temperature, because there's a temperature sensor right there. That's pretty cool. And just to show you that it's actually live, I'm actually changing to use like the RGB example instead. And there you go. It's changing color. That's pretty frictionless. This is pretty impressive what you can do with these technologies. So this showed like your device capable of running JavaScript. It showed like, the whole bootstrapping thing and that the device was actually powered over USB. So USB is a bit more complicated than Bluetooth. There are actually three different types of transfers. So you have bulk, uh, it's the fastest, but there's no guaranteed timing. You don't know when you receive things. It might not be immediately. But it's pretty useful, it's used in printers and serial connections. Then you have interrupt. It has a guaranteed maximum latency, which is nice, for instance, for a keyboard, because you don't want to be typing and then waiting like two seconds before the characters actually show up on your screen. And for something like video, where you, you don't care if you lose a frame or, or two, uh, they have something called isochronous transfers. So these are the three different transfer types in USB. USB works with some headers that you need to define, um, and the web USB specification adds a few extra, which are optional, uh, and they allow you to do more security and uh, restrict, for instance, other sites from accessing your device. So they're optional, uh, they're required for the dialogue, uh, because you need some way to tell you which site is associated with it, um, and you can restrict other sites from accessing the device. It looks something like this. There's a few issues with uh, USB, so if you're interested in this, you should definitely talk with Lars. Uh, this is especially, there's some problems with using serial connection on Linux uh, and on Windows, because the OS tries to hijack the drivers. But there are ways around that. Uh, I'll just skip over that. Um, the API is very, very similar to Bluetooth. Um, see, everything is with, with different uh, returning promises. You also request a device with some kind of filter, but there's a few extra things you need to do. This is just like how USB works. With new things like async await and JavaScript, you see, it, it le you can get really, really clean code. It's really easy to do. Like, I request a device, I open it, select configuration, claim interface, then I can have a control transfer, I can send something, and I can do a, a, int, a transfer in, which is like receiving something. This works today on Chrome, in Linux, Macs, and Windows, and it's shipped yesterday to Stable. So you can actually use this today. As with Bluetooth, here's a URL. I'll share the links. Uh, I'll put them on Twitter later. If you follow me, you can find the links and learn more. Wow, that's a lot of info. But there's actually a lot of other things going on the web with hardware. So a lot of companies actually just need to track stuff. It's a very common use case. Like maybe your shop, you have, have products. So barcodes are pretty commonly used. It's actually one of those things you've heard from a lot of people using Cordova they need a barcode scanner. This is also one of the things we're bringing to Chrome. It makes it easy to quickly uh, read and track things get, and get information around you, and even do like quick actions. So maybe Bluetooth beacons is the solution you're looking for in some cases. Um, maybe you want NFC tags because you can do more and it requires like a physical uh, touch. So, well, sometimes just like QR codes are uh, the best solution because they're cheap, you can just print them. So Chrome, um, behind the flag, this is not shipping yet. Um, they have something called a barcode detector. It's actually part of an API called Ship Detections. So it works with any kind of like video stream or photo, so you can identify faces or barcodes. So here's just one example of me detecting a barcode on an image. And that's pretty, pretty useful. NFC is something uh, I've been involved with myself. Um, so this is kind of the same, it's a bit more complex. Um, I can, when you connect an NFC, to, uh, like an active device, like a phone, it's actively powered. NFC tag, which is passively powered, it means that there's no like, battery associated. When you put the phone close to it, it, the phone will actually power the chip. And at that point, 
you can read and write. So here I'm just showing some examples of how you could push like a URL to one of these chips. Here, do something else. I'm watching for changes. So every time I, I touch, if uh, this is an empty tag, I immediately push my name to it as JSON. Really well integrated with JavaScript. If not, I just read the value. So this is the function I did for actually processing the message itself. So if it's JSON, I just pull out the, the info. If it's an image, I could even like show that. So this is like also pretty powerful. Even Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web, was pretty excited about this. So <laughs> um, this is the demo I was showing to him. So this is a small app I did, progressive web app. Um, it's a shopping list. So you can basically uh, add items. So I'm adding milk. Might be a bit difficult to see, and I can write it to that tag. So now it's written, and I can read, and it gets added to my shopping list. And now I'm writing cocoa. I'm trying to write it to the same. Uh, it actually fails for a moment because I'm not f I don't know where this <laughs> NFC chip is. <laughs> but there we go. And if I press it again, you see all the others, you get different products. So this is like a shopping list I could have at my home. I could just like place this around my house. Like whenever I'm missing toilet paper, take up the phone and it gets added to my list. <laughs> But what about connecting to other devices to control and to receive data? Like something like a sensor. People love sensors. They're super cool. And my phone, it already has a lot of them. So at Intel, we, we tried to tackle this problem. We looked at like, maybe we could come up with an API that kind of like scales the future. That will work well with Node, IoT devices, and the web itself. So we worked on this called Generic Sensor API. So we worked together also with one of the guys, the inventor of uh, Johnny5, is a very popular um, Node.js-based IoT platform. And we've been working on all kinds of sensors, like gyroscope, orientation sensor, magnetometer, accelerometer, ambient light sensors, a lot of them. But like sensors are difficult. And when I got into this field, I was like, why can't I just buy a book that tells me like, how to use all these different sensors? What do you do with them? How do you understand the input? How do you merge them together? So I, that was actually quite impossible to find. So I ended up writing an explainer, uh, especially about like motion sensors, uh, how all of this works. So I recommend you check that out if you're interested. So the API is really, really simple to use. You just instantiate the sensor. It might not actually exist. You'll find out when you try to start it. Uh, you can put in some options like frequency. Uh, then there's like an on-reading function. And then you just start it. That simple. Uh, this is one example where I'm showing how you could do fusion uh, of an accelerometer and a gyroscope. Uh, so this is, of course, some math involved. This is something called a complementary filter. All of that is explained in that document I was just referring to. So. Let's look at the video to see what you can actually do with this. Because like, now we have like a very nice API that works with my phone, and we have this thing called Web Bluetooth. Maybe we could combine them. So what I actually did is I took the Google Daydream controller, this one, um, and I exposed it, like all the data, like a generic sensors. So we just like flip it in my small demo app. Um, so let's look at the video. So I made this demo app. I just connect to the Daydream controller. And there we go. But you also have smart devices, so you could also do this yourself. Like this is a small smart device we have at Intel called a Tiny Tile. It's pretty nice. It has like a, a, a six axis combo sensor with a sort of and gyroscope. So I could do the exact same. Probably took me around 15 minutes. This just shows the power of what you can do with Web Bluetooth. And actually, with the device that Lars has downstairs, the Nordic, I did, we, you can do the exact same. I did that just a couple of days ago. <laughs> so I was showing you this IDE idea I had before with Web Bluetooth. We actually turned that into a product. Uh, so you see, this is just a website. 
where you actually go in and actually do like JavaScript coding. Very simple. Uh, you see, you just, it also supports the generic sensors, so we implemented this on this device itself with the exact same API. So what I'm actually doing is that I'm using generic sensors on the IoT device itself and on the client. And as you see, it's like very few lines of code. Like I have like six, 71 lines of code. So the summary is like the web is already ready to create like nice uh, app-like experiences. And you can effortlessly connect to USB and Bluetooth devices today. Both of them are shipping in Chrome. And we hope that other browsers will follow soon. NFC barcoders are coming. Uh, they're behind a flag in Chrome. So if you use like Chrome Canary, you go to a site called about colon uh, flags, you can actually go and turn it on. Um, some of these features might be behind different flags, like some of the sensors are. Some of them might just be behind what is called uh, the experimental web platform features. We actually just announced that generic sensors like the motion sensors will become what is called an origin trial in Chrome. This means that if you want to play around with these things today and you want to get like actual user feedback, you can go to a specific site, you request a token for a specific version of Chrome, you put that on your site like a meta tag or in the request headers on your server, and all your users should have access to that API. Uh, at least for one version of Chrome. And that's a good way uh, that we're doing in Chrome today to get like feedback from actual users. Because it's kind of hard, like as a company, you want to deploy something new like uh, web, uh, web payments, but you can only do it inside your labs because like regular users will not go in and, and add a specific flag in the browser. At least my mom, she won't. <laughs> Generic sensors are also pretty cool. They expose a lot of sensors to the web, so we really hope that people will find like new use cases. Uh, and we also try to integrate this with other APIs, such as like web VR, because we really want like all the APIs on the web to work the same way. So this accounts for like orientation, VR, uh, geolocation, and all of that. So basically, the web is ready. Let's build the future. If you want to get these slides, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, but more importantly, there's a quiz. So this quiz is actually a bit, a bit tough. Uh, so we'll look at like who's getting the most points. And I think like Lars, you had around like 25 devices with you. Um, and if you come and talk to Lars and you're really interested in web USB, you might also get one of these free web light devices from Google. This is done by a Googler. It's a very nice like USB device. You plug it in. And from a website, you can actually change the lights. It's just really good to show like, how easy and effortless these things work. So with that, thank you.